Let's start with the first rule, the literal rule. The words in the statutes must be given their ordinary and literal meaning. Effectively, what it means is ordinary meaning that you can find in a dictionary. This is the general rule of interpreting any words or clauses within the statute. It is assumed that the draftsmen have chosen the words carefully and used those words in their ordinary meanings. This rule is applied unless there is a good reason to depart from this general rule. This rule was explained in the case of Sussex Peerage case 1844. It said, the only rule for the construction of Acts of Parliament is that they should be construed according to the intent of the Parliament which passed the Act. If the words of the statute are in themselves precise and unambiguous, then no more can be necessary than to expound those words in their natural and ordinary sense. The words themselves alone do, in such case, best declare the intention of the lawgiver by Chief Justice Tyndall. And this is a logical rule that follows the ordinary principles of texts and language. If some text is not clear, any reader or interpreter would look the word up in a dictionary to make sense of the word. The laws are made for the public. Note that and, and are supposed to contain words and terms understandable by the general members of the public. But there is another reason for this rule to be applied and that comes under the heading of application of judicial restraint. And what is that judicial restraint? Again, taking its literal meaning, stop something, restrain something, limit something. So how is that done? Well, the judges are supposed to be the interpreters of the legislation, not the makers of law. Although, many argue, well, they make law as well, but they are not supposed to make law. They are only interpreters of the legislation. They are supposed to implement the intention of the parliament. They need to make sure that they do not add or take anything away from the legislation passed by the people's representatives. This is the limitation that the judges put on themselves to make sure that they keep their role limited to the interpreters of the law. However, following literal rules strictly may cause issues with the interpretation of statutes. Uh, let's look at an example. In the case of Whiteley and Chapel 1868 case, the defendant in this case pretended to be someone who was on the voters list and had died. The defendant was charged with the offence of impersonating a person entitled to vote. In this case, the defendant was found not guilty. The court applied a literal rule in this case and held that a dead person is not a person entitled to vote. Hence, the offence cannot be made out for impersonating a dead person. Excellent example. If we look at the possible intention of the Parliament in such cases, clearly the intention of the Parliament would be to stop people casting bogus votes and not whether the person who was being impersonated was dead or alive. However, taking the literal rule approach, the wording is clear that the person being impersonated should be a person entitled to vote. In the case of R against Judge of the City of London Court, 1892, Lord Escher M.R. supported the literal rule in the following words. If the words of an act are clear, then you must follow them, even though they lead to a manifest absurdity. The view seems to be encouraging to limit the approach of the judges in interpreting the statutes. Lord Diplock's statement in the case of Duport Steels Limited against Sirs, 1980, a recent case, comparatively, the case reflects the rationale behind this approach. And it states, if this be the case, it is for Parliament, not for the judiciary, to decide whether any changes should be made to the law as stated in the Acts. Clear. Let's look at two more popular examples, London and North Eastern Railway and Barryman, 1946 case. And then we look at the case of Partridge and Crittenden, um, a famous contract law case. First, in the case of London and North Eastern Railway and Barryman, a railway worker was killed in an accident whilst he was oiling the railway track. 
the law provided for compensation payable on death for those who were in commas relaying or repairing the railway track remember that problem that we discussed when judges or lawyers might face while interpreting the statutes and the laws this is a fine example of that according to the literal rule relaying or repairing did not mean oiling it's either relay or repair there was no ambiguity in the words hence it was not possible for the court to extend the meaning despite the result of such ruling being harsh the claim of the widow was unsuccessful in this case simply because the words were limited in their meaning relaying or repairing could not have meant oiling let's look at now the second example of partridge and cretendon 1968 case where the defendant advertised for sale a number of wild birds the price was advertised to be 25 shillings as it was for each according to the protection of birds act 1954 it was unlawful to offer in commas any wild live bird for sale the defendants were found not guilty because the advertised price was only an invitation to treat and not an offer for sale since there was clear difference between the invitation to treat and an offer the court applied literal meaning of the law the court further clarified that the legislature had chosen the phrase offer for sale based on its existing understanding and to change this understanding was not proper for the court i hope you understand what the literal rule means and how it is has been applied by the courts there are quizzes and exercises which you can utilize to cement your understanding the quizzes are given um, at the end of this course let's look at our next lecture which is on the golden rule